that's not what we're going to do. We're actually going to give you the me. We're going to give you what you're normally used to. I'm not going to water it down. I'm not going to mainstream it. I have to give you what it is that I've been giving you. Because, you know, one episode is, ah. Uh... But today it's going to sound like one of the episodes of the best of. But no, honestly, what we're going to get into today is something that I actually found interesting and kind of sort of along the lines of a video that I just did with, um, I believe his name was Daniel Ross. He's with the Dallas Cowboys and he was arrested. And I did a video breakdown. Not necessarily that the arrest itself was illegal or anything that the police officer did in the video was illegal. But I did a breakdown that consisted of the things that were said and the interpretations that was gathered from what the police officer did in the video. So I'm going to say this one more time. The video that I did break down with the Daniel Ross um, arrest, not saying that the police officer did anything wrong. I'm also just pointing out things that were said and the in inferences that was done throughout the stop. So kind of pay attention to the verbiage because that's one of the things I talk about. Words have power, but I need you to be able to listen. That's why you were given two ears and one mouth because you should listen twice as much as you speak. And you shouldn't just listen to wait for a response. You should actually listen to understand the substance that's being given to you. Now, like I said, today we're actually gonna do one that I was thinking about, and it's Collins v. Virginia. And it deals with the automobile exception that do not permit warrantless entry of a home or its cartilage in order to search a vehicle therein. Now, just to give you a little context on that. There was a traffic incident in which one involved a person that may or may not have fled the scene. Well, the person made it all the way to the home, you know, at least they were thought they'd been made all the way to the home, where the police officer got a tip that that's where the vehicle or second vehicle was. And not only did he enter the property without a warrant, he also lifted up a tarp saw under it, took pictures of it without permission or consent. And again, it's understanding the right to be secure in one's person and property. And Collins v. Virginia goes into the absolute facts of the definition of property. Because if you remember a while back, I did a cell phone video and it spoke about going into one's cell phone. Because again, that falls under property because there's a lot of information that's given or even taken from cell phones at these days. And, you know, from your location to your heart rate. So there's a lot of information that can be gathered from it. But in order for that to be done, there has to be a pretext in which the cell phone is the actual focus or the, the uh, instrument of a crime. And that's one of the things that was missing in this one. Now, you just say, hold on, there was damage to someone's property. So why couldn't, couldn't the police officer do, do the search without a warrant? Again, it's going back to when I spoke about exigent circumstances. Because even the video that I did where I spoke about a police officer that ran in on a suspect and the suspect threw a gun under the couch. Well, the gun was suppressed via a map hearing simply because the suspect was in custody and the police officer had one thing to do, secure the scene and then apply for a warrant. Because a lot of times when you're talking about what can be proven and what can't be proven, it's a lot of people tell me, oh, well, it's their word against mine. Well, here's the great part about that you have an opportunity for cross-examination. And this is where the listening comes in at, understanding the power of words. Because I had an incident in which a police officer spoke about um, something that um, he had done and that, and 
in the inference of it, he stated, this is what happened matter of factly. I smiled, I stood up, and my simple question was for him to repeat what he had stated matter of factly. And he did just that. In fact, it was during my racketeering trials, during the RICO trials. I believe his name was Officer Johnson. He got up and he spoke about how he had followed me and had determined that I lived at one address simply because it was the address that was on my resume. I think you heard me say this before. And on my cross-examination, I asked him, I said, do y'all mind putting that impressive ass resume up? And they put it back up. And I asked him, I said, That's, that, that resume is impressive as hell, isn't it? He goes, yes, sir. I said, now, yeah, you do see that there's a cell phone number on there, right? He goes, yes, sir. I said, can your cell phone travel? He said, yes, it, yes, it can. I said, and you stated that you followed me. He said, yes, I did. I said, and you determined that I lived at the address through following me. And he goes, and yes, I did. I said, great. Where was the warrant that you had? Because again, the great part of that is, where's your proof? You can say whatever it is you like, because it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. And I asked, where's the proof to support your statement? Because this is where people have their affidavits, where everybody wants to tell their opinion. They want to give their side. The simple question to break out all that monotonous BS, where's your truth to support your statement? Where's your proof? And that is one of the most difficult things for people to understand. Just because you're making a statement, just because you're putting forth an affidavit, where's your proof? Because it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. Because I could say a whole lot of stuff, but if there's nothing to support what I'm saying, it doesn't exist. 